Thank you. You got it. All right. So, what's going on? How are okay. you doing? Hi. Um, I'm I'm Leah. Mm -hmm. I am a program manager on the Messenger team. Um, so today I've got a whole bunch of people in the room. So Messenger is this little the little product that kind of fits on the side of your screen, but it actually requires all kinds of people to get it going. Mm -hmm. So we gathered a bunch of people in the room today okay. uh, to talk to you about the different parts of Messenger. Excellent. And these are the people who actually built it. Yes, right? we have developers um, and program managers all in the room. Fantastic. Get their hands dirty in the code of Messenger. So what do you do? Are so you a program manager? I'm a program manager. I actually work on, it's kind of a funny role, it's a customer satisfaction role. I spend a lot of time uh, around the news groups and the blogs trying to figure out what are the um, kind of hot ticket items. And I gather that all up and bring it back into my team to try and help us address the, the hottest, latest issues. Excellent. All right. Well, and who's this person over here? Hi. Um, I'm Adam Seisler, and I'm a dev lead uh, on Messenger. And uh, a lot of people think I'm a PM, but I'm not a <laughs> uh, program manager. Uh, so uh, my team is responsible for, let's see, the, the platform in Messenger and the UX. Um, so UX being for the people out there. Oh, so user the UX is the user experience, okay. yeah. So, so what we're talking about is essentially the uh, when you see the conversation window, when you actually see the buttons and the sort of look of it, that's all um, part of my team. Um, and uh, we actually have a bunch of different, we kind of split into some what we call program areas, um, and they are responsible for different parts of the product. So, for example, uh, voice and video. So when we uh, make, a, make a telephone call, uh, make an audio call, that's a different team. And uh, um, also we have sharing. We'll get into that later. Cool. Uh, all right. All right. Thanks. Excellent. I'm going to wander over here so I can actually hear you. These are little mics. So. Hi, I'm Katie Blanche. I'm a developer on the Messenger team as well. Um, I kind of work under Adam a couple levels. Um, okay. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, I'm, the latest feature that I worked on that's pretty cool that I'm hoping to talk to you guys about is uh, this new plugin model that we have. So. Very cool. Where, where people can write their own plugins. That's correct. Very Finally. Very cool. <laughs> Excellent. Hi, I'm John Holmes. I'm the development lead that owns the platform on the IM client in Messenger. And I guess we do some platform stuff for other parts nowadays, but uh, that wasn't really planned. Um, and so I also was the developer who originally wrote all the peer-to-peer -peer features in Messenger and uh, wow. a bunch of uh, client server stuff and sort of a lot of networking things. So. Excellent. Nice job. I'm Dan McCulloch. I'm a program manager on the Windows Live Messenger team. Mm -hmm. I own Yahoo Interop. I own other things, but that's the big one right now. Well, that's a huge one. We should dig, dig into that for sure. All right. Hi, I'm Arti. Um, I'm a developer on the team, and uh, I've primarily worked on uh, Yahoo Interop. Um, I'm supposed to be a UX dev, but um, I just do a lot of platform work these days. Okay. And Excellent. Nice job. Hi, I'm David. Uh, I'm actually on a different team altogether. I'm on the Messenger server team. Uh -huh. uh, but I did a lot of the work behind the sharing folders feature in Messenger. Okay. Excellent. So um, th you guys are releasing something new, right? Or you did. There was a beta. Yeah, well, released, what was it, yesterday? Actually, so we've been in beta for almost a year now. Uh -huh. And uh, just yesterday we released the final version mm. of the client. So. Uh, we're all pretty excited around here. Definitely. Yeah. So what's it like to write software that, you know, at least, what, 150 million people use every day? At least. At least. 200. 200. 240 million. 240 million. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, that, that's incredible, right? I mean, it's awesome. It's also, it's, it's a big success and a big, you know, challenge because you have so many different types of people all over the world using the same piece of software. So it's something that we're dealing with all the time, how to make things work in, you know, 30 different languages. And hey, when, I, when I first started, I was, you know, they're like, make messenger stuff go through NATs and, and on people's home, which, you know, home networks. So mm -hmm. stuff works all the time. And I was like, uh-oh, I'm going to open up all these security holes. And I was like worried. And, but now I'm just like, I've been here like four years. I'm like, whatever. I, I send stuff out and it's great and people like it. And I'm not nearly as worried. I'm more relaxed. And, yeah. But of course, of course, you still take security seriously. And oh, kind of much more so. Now there's like a whole process around it, yeah. and like there's there's like institutionalized worry about security. Yeah. Right? So, like, <laughs> you know, we have like 
outside people come in and like try to do like penetration hacking against our, our protocols and we you know we have our own like threat modeling and security reviews and work with cryptographers and it's like this you know it's much less worrying for me I guess because now we focus so much more on it as a, as a company maybe I don't know sure I think one thing that's kind of uh, interesting about having a product um, that touches so many people you know 240 million people first of all it's like a number that's impossible for me at least to even conceptualize it and say it, but you don't really get it. Uh, but one thing is you, you do have to sort of please everyone. I mean, people can say, hey, my mom won't be able to use this, but it's like my mom is not the only person. You, it's got to work for my mom and my friend who's a really, you know, power user. And that's, I think, some of the hardest uh, um, challenges we have. So there's technical challenges, and then there's also the challenge of what do we actually build mm -hmm. and whatever we do. And later we're going to get to some of the questions on the on the forum, but um, from the Niners, from the Niners, yeah. See, I told you guys that we'd ask them. <laughs> right. Yeah, so we'll get to those, and and a lot of them, you know, I don't know if our answers our answers will necessarily be satisfactory, but um, some of the reasons why we do things have mm -hmm. to do with that sort of broad, huge base of, of, of people that we have. Sure. Um, so now, since our audience is mainly developers and you know some children, <laughs> names I won't mention. Sorry. Um, how does this work? Like, how does instant messenger work? Is it really peer to peer? Uh, okay, so I it's mean, not, is it really peer to peer? Yeah. Um, I guess I, I'll throw on the whiteboard. Good. Yeah. yeah. Very um, good. So messenger is like a hybrid client server peer to peer app. So mm -hmm. it started off client server. So let me draw a couple clients. So there's Alice and Bob here, mm -hmm. and then each of Alice and Bob log into a server. Yep. That's in our data center called a connection server, which is why I wrote CS. Mm -hmm. um, the, these are persistent TCP connections. They could also be proxied through an HTTP gateway if necessary because of firewall issues and things like that. Behind these connection servers is a back end consisting of a bunch of present servers. So, you know, there's lots of these. Um, each person will get uh, hashed basically to some present server that is their present server for that, that particular person. Um, the present server is where things like your friendly name, your status, the way online, all that stuff, your, uh, the, the description of what your user picture is, your personal status message that you type into Messenger, all that stuff is stored in your present server. Your buddies, they're, when they tell uh, the connection server who um, their buddies are, their connection servers subscribe to their buddies' present servers to get the presence information that is sent up through the, the client server connection. So that's how the presence system in Messenger sort of works. So okay. Alice changes her status to offline, it goes up to the CS, uh, up to the presence server, down through the subscription to the CS, and then down to Bob's client, and then mm -hmm. Bob can show the new status. Um, instant messages go through a sort of another pathway in Messenger. There's these other servers called mixers that send the IM traffic. So when Alice wants to talk to somebody, Alice get, uh, tells her CS, basically, I would like to talk to somebody. The CS says, OK, go talk to this mixer, and sends her over to a mixer. Mm -hmm. Then on the mixer, Alice can say, I want to talk to Bob. And then the mixer will route a message through lots of packets, basically. But eventually, it'll go through the CS and come down to Bob. And Bob will say, oh, Alice wants to talk to me, look up to the mixer, and then I guess I'll, I'll use Red for this, because mm -hmm. they can talk back and forth through the mixer and send IMs. Excellent. Now, that's all client server so far. Where it gets to be peer-to-peer -peer is when they want to send larger pieces of data, like a file or the user tile pictures or audio video or you know, sort of anything like that. Um, and basically how that works is we set up one of these mixer sessions between the two people who want to talk. And then through the sessions, we send a couple packets back and forth that sort of negotiate like how to set up a direct connection, how to set up a secure connection. So I might tell you, my IP address is this, and I support you know these types of protocols, and I have this sort of uh, NAT or firewall, and you'll tell me what you've got, and then we can say, OK, here's how we can set up a direct connection. Um, and, and in most cases, set up a direct connection from A to B and send data backwards, that, back and forth that way. But if that fails, and if we can't do that, we can always send data through the mixer. Um, and so the data sort of always can make it from one side to another, um, which is which is pretty good uh, for voice and, and video stuff, or I guess for voice stuff, not really. Well, for voice and video, there are different relay servers other than the mixers that do sort of the same function, but it's not really 
technically important that they're different servers. So, um, so John, you want to talk about? Uh, so you, you you mentioned there was a peer connection that was made, if if possible, but maybe you can kind of dive a little deeper into the details about how you use TCP and we fall back to UDP, etc., and the kind of some of the sure, yeah. some of the strategies we um, use there. Yeah. So. So we have this whole abstraction in our client called a, a transport um, and a uh, sort of master session. Underneath the, the transport, basically any sort of feature in our code that a developer, like uh, you know, any developer on the team wants to work on, like mm -hmm. file transfer or file sharing or uh, user tile transfer, any of these pictures, I mean features, mm -hmm. um, that a person wants to work on, uh, they can use this abstraction of a transport and say, I'd like to get a transport to my buddy, Bob. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, so they make a call on the transport saying, or on the master session really saying, I'd like a session to Bob, so give me Bob. And then uh, the mechanics here basically set up one of those mixer sessions to Bob uh, and provide an abstraction that lets them do things like send data, you know, they get like an on-receive event. Um, inside of our code base. Mm -hmm. And then underneath the transport, the way that's all abstracting is you have all these queues, but you have a bunch of bridges uh, to actually send the data. So there's three sort of ways we can send data right now, and we're adding a fourth, um, that the data will actually get to the person. So we either can set up a direct TCP connection, which is our first choice, because that's you know fast, reliable, you know, great, works well. A lot of times we can't. We try to set up a, a direct UDP connection. The problems with the UDP, as probably some of you know, are that it's not a connection-based protocol, so that uh, you know packets can get lost, packets can be delivered out of order, they cannot be delivered at all. So we have built on top of UDP our own sort of reliability, you know, guarantees. Um, and then if UDP fails, we'll send stuff through the mixer using the same protocols we would send IMs. Mm -hmm. um, what are uh, on the UDP bit? What are some of the differences between the reliability that you built on top of UDP and TCP itself? Oh, uh, so so for simple simplification of testing and development, mm -hmm. uh, what we built on top of UDP was uh, an ARQ one protocol. It's like <laughs> ARQ one, which just means automatically automatic retransmit requests and have one packet in flight at any time. So basically, if there's two guys and this guy wants to send packets to that guy, he can only have one packet out at once, and the packet sort of heads across to this guy, and then he can send, this guy sends an acknowledgement back that comes here, and then this guy will send his next packet when he gets the acknowledgement. If he doesn't ever get an acknowledgement, he just retransmits that packet, and okay. keeps doing that until he gets an acknowledgement eventually. Whereas TCP has all this sliding window stuff and sends a bunch of packets at once and you know really optimizes the throughput in, 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 in a much more serious way than we do, which is why we prefer TCP. Right, so the so, so disadvantage of this is it's potentially much slower. It is. Uh, yes. A high latency link is potentially much slower because the, you have to wait for a full round trip before sending your is, next is packet. It like, is it duplex that you have two packets, so ARQ1 in each direction? Uh, yes, it is ARQ1 in each direction. Um, and we don't... I don't even remember if we piggyback the axe or not. I wrote that years ago, so. <laughs> cool. So fundamentally, this architecture hasn't changed in our latest and greatest version. Yeah. Of uh, fundamentally, it has not um, changed too much. This stuff has changed here um, in our in our eight O version. So it used to be before eight O that uh, when you first logged in, so when Alice. Alice first connected up to her connection server. Mm -hmm. The connection server would talk to this backend server called the address book okay. to find out who all of Alice's buddies are and then send them down to Alice through this channel. Mm. The difference is that now um, Alice will talk directly to the address book, find out who her buddies are, and then send them up to the connection server. Um, that's the main difference in the client-server interaction in this version. SSL stuff? Oh, yeah, SSL yeah. stuff is a new version, of the, is a new feature of the peer-to-peer -peer stuff. That's a good point. So, before 8.0, this channel was unencrypted. Um, uh -huh. this, this channel, and also the red channel here, basically anything that went through this transport system was unencrypted before. Okay. Um, and now we've added SSL-based encryption to it. We've got uh, Passport, so Passport, will issue certificates to to users that ask for them. These are like short-lived but actual certificates that say, 
Bob is really who Bob claims to be. And mm -hmm. based on Alice having a certificate and Bob having a certificate, the two of them can set up a, a SSL or TLS uh, connection to each other and then encrypt data. The only data we're encrypting right now is in the file sharing feature. Um, but there's nothing in principle that would stop us from encrypting all the data that goes across the transport. And it's really end-to-end -end encrypted. I mean, sure. you can't decrypt it on on our mixer, even though the data is going through. But if you, ju if you uh, encrypted and decrypted messages, simple text over, I mean, that would affect performance, no? SSL? Uh, well, no, but not really, because the, okay. it's end-to-end. -end, so it's A and B that are doing the encryption. And oh, I see. It, it, the mixer wouldn't be decrypting them in the middle. It would just, they would just be these encrypted packets sort of flying through. Got it. And, and even the, the real issue, I think, with, with S-Channel and SSL is the, um, is the connection establishment. That's a really expensive operation. And so since you're not typically setting up a lot of connections to other people all the time, uh, the actual overhead isn't that much on a reasonable you know, PC. So PCs are getting really, really fast. You know, Intel keeps asking, you know, what are people going to do with all these cycles? So there's one thing you can do. You can encrypt all your traffic. Cool. So is there a WCF in your future? And uh, What's WCF? <laughs> it used to be called Indigo? Oh, <laughs> well, apparently not. Um, okay. So, uh, uh, Someday. It's, it's, something that, space. It's, it's something that back when it was like web services and web services enhancements, we sort of thought about <laughs> that stuff. Um, yeah. And uh, really, we've got a large legacy built up in this protocol. I mean, we're on the... We're working now on the 16th version of, of the MSNP, the Microsoft Notification Protocol, um, and, and, and we, you know, these servers support many versions back, and the clients support several versions depending on the version of the client. And you know, it's something we're definitely thinking about, but mm -hmm. no real plans. Do you want to talk about um, offline IMs and, and how the web service works there? Jeez. Uh, I, I don't really know it as well as some people might, but well, I mean, generally speaking, generally, we, generally speaking, to send an offline message, we have a another uh, offline IM <coughs> web service. So if if Alice is offline when Bob wants to send Alice an IM, yes, um, Bob sends a message to this offline IM web service that goes and stores the message in Hotmail. Uh huh. Um, then when Alice logs in. Uh, Alice's server gets a message from Hotmail that says that uh, there's a message waiting for that you. there's a message waiting for you, and then Alice goes and retrieves it from the I think from the web service. Yeah, um, and so you could have a purely offline conversation because then Bob is offline when she retrieves it, sends him one, goes back up there, he yeah. gets online, yeah. she's offline, and you just yeah. have an offline party. Some people yeah. like to call that. That email. Exactly. It's moderately instant messages. Yeah, it's emails. I mean, they're in Hotmail. Yeah. They're, they're, they're emails. Like. Well, the cool thing, I mean, the thing is, though, as far as when you go back to, like, UX, um, in the old days, which I guess is the last version, when I tried to contact somebody who was offline, I got this little message that says, you want to send them an email? Yeah. Then it launched my email client. Yeah, right. Much better. Yeah. Much better. And, and the key is when the person, uh, when the buddy responds to you, the other contact, it comes via messenger. I mean, we, we will try to, uh, you know, it all stays within the same experience, so you're not right. in some of the other email program. Another thing I wanted to note on that, though, is that we actually do try to, we have the feature of appearing offline, and there's a somewhat complex interaction that can happen when essentially, uh, uh, if, if I'm appearing offline, Mm -hmm. uh, and if we're both appearing offline, let's say, mm -hmm. uh, and I send you an offline message, it'll actually go through that, that offline IM web service. You'll receive it, but um, you, you can, if you're actually online, you can actually set up an SB session w with me and we can actually communicate over the SB. Mixer. Oh, I'm sorry, the Mixer. So we've changed the name. Um, so so, so that, the, the intention is so that we can actually have less latency because if we go through the offline mm -hmm. IAM web service, you know, it can take quite a while we have, uh, to, to get the messages. So um, anyway, that's, it's not necessarily the optimum design. It would be kind of cool if we could just talk to the CS and uh, have the messages just routed offline or online depending. Um, but that's the way it works today. Very cool. So what else do we have going on here? Well, so John was mentioning that, you know, that the, the sharing f feature is one of the things we do a little bit differently. We're actually doing a lot with sharing right now. It's, it's one of our exciting uh, areas. And uh, David's actually the right person to talk a little bit more about that, so maybe we can delve into the sharing. Sure. Yeah, maybe we should talk about the S-channel and 
yeah. how you use the transport section? We, we can talk about that a little bit if you want, yeah. Um, the, the S channel in some sense was, was a necessity of going with sharing because obviously you don't want to share your files uh, with other people when anyone on the internet could read them. That would be uh -huh. a bad thing. So, yep. um, so one of the sort of requirements to make sharing happen was to get that S channel stuff in. But I think, uh, do you want to go into more detail on that? Or is I don't it, know. Uh, well, let's talk about what is sharing. What are we talking about here? So, so the basic files? idea of sharing uh, to go technical is uh, basically peer-to-peer -peer replication with a multi-master uh, sort of scheme. So basically every copy on every computer is sort of equally valid, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, so the nice thing about doing sharing in this way as opposed to other ways of doing sharing is that uh, it's completely asynchronous. So I can share with you regardless of whether you're online or offline, and when you eventually become online, uh, the things that I've shared or changed propagate to your computer automatically. Um, and similarly, when you're interacting with the stuff that I shared to you, you're interacting with it on the local computer, and it's just as fast as if it were your own files. Mm -hmm. So um, literally, we're just taking a folder on your computer and a folder on my computer and guaranteeing that those folders uh, you know, maintain the same basic... They're synced. They're synced, yeah. Okay. So, um, so that's what we're doing. Um, what I think is really cool about this is um, sort of within, I don't know, we're baited in December, we're basically the largest peer-to-peer -peer system, I think, that supports mutations. Uh, there were other peer-to-peer -peer systems that, that really didn't support overwrites, um, which make if you don't have things change, it's a lot easier to maintain copies that are equal because they didn't change. Mm -hmm. um, but we're the first ones to really do it, really broad, really wide scale in a way that, that things can change, and we maintain consistency across uh, the, the different copies. So what we're doing instead is we, we actually have the contents, and so we, uh, you know, if, if I have a file named foo and you have a file, you know, named foo that are different content, we'll detect that. And, and deal with it appropriately. So you keep a master copy? That's we don't actually, so that's the here. point of multi-master is that uh -huh. every, every is copy that? is a master copy. Okay. So, that's so how do you determine about whether it. or not the files are equivalent? Where do you do that? Um, so each each master, each each copy does its own um, determination of this. We use a, a technology actually that we've been, we've been taken from uh, from Windows. It's shipped with Windows in uh, Server 2000. So I guess it wasn't called that. Uh, Windows 2000 had, a, had some technology um, called the file replication system that's used underneath Active Directory in Windows, and we took the the the, the file replication technology there and, and repackaged it and shipped it with Messenger, and so we're using the same basic uh, technology. It's actually a re-implementation from the Windows 2000 version, but um, Very cool. same basic idea. So I can go into details of, of how that stuff works, but basically the idea is that um, we track changes to files in the file system, mm -hmm. um, and for every change, uh, we record the, file, the files that have changed. And then when the two uh, peers talk to each other, we can very efficiently tell each other, you know, each one tells the other what has changed and what hasn't changed. Well, tells each other what has changed. Mm -hmm. And they can just download those changes and, and make the changes happen locally, and then you end up with a consistent version. Cool. The, um, the negative of doing it this way with a multi-master is that you and I can change the same file in different ways. And at the end of the day, we have to have one copy of that file. So one of our changes ends up sort of losing, as it were, and, and, and being moved to what we call the conflict store. Understood, the conflict store. So what's interesting about that is we don't know whether people care about these conflicts or not. And so one of the things we want to learn um, as people use the sharing folder feature is how many people actually go and look at the conflict store and do something with it. Sure. Well, I mean, if, I, if we were sharing a, a, a document and we were both changing it and only one got saved, so the next day that I look at it, I, my changes aren't there, or that person's changes aren't there, that's a bummer. It is, but to be honest, what ends up happening, like if you and I are working on a document, mm -hmm. I'll say, hey, I'm working on this section of the document. Don't work on it until I mm -hmm. tell you. Uh, and then okay. I go ahead and work on it. Um, people have built lots of complicated locking schemes to try to deal with this problem, but mm -hmm. uh, in general that tends to fall back to a social mechanism where people just sort of agree to work on different portions of, sure. of the project. Or in Vista, you could take advantage of the transactional file system. Uh, you could do that, but that requires application support as well. And sure. in fact, it wouldn't help here because what you really want is distributed transactions. The problem with distributed transactions is that uh, all peers have to be online and communicating at the same time. Mm -hmm. So if any of them are offline, you can't do the transaction at all. So what we're allowing you to do is let, let the transaction continue even though some, some of the nodes aren't online. Very cool. Very cool. Do you want to talk about uh, another thing that I, I, I find different about uh, the way that we've done the sharing folders is that uh, we actually, when you say we listen to changes on the file system, we literally listen to the journal record of, uh, uh, of the whole file system. So sure. the way that we expose it today mm -hmm. in the user, you know, in the UX is we actually have click on a buddy and you open up the sharing folder and it's one particular place mm -hmm. um, uh, on your hard drive but um, from the technically we're actually we could 
do much more if we wanted to. We've just chosen to limit it uh, in this way because we thought it was simpler to show to the user. Um, Very good. So let me let me draw a little architectural just to show you how it fits into Messenger. Um, so if you think you have the Messenger binary that's, that's there today that has, as John described before, this sort of peer-to-peer -peer transport and a bunch of other stuff, of course. What we've added is um, we've added a DLL that basically takes this code from Windows and wraps it um, in a way the messenger can call into it for one, but also um, takes all the things. So when you have code that's in Windows, obviously it can it can interact with the rest of Windows. But when you take that code out, it can't interact with the rest of Windows necessarily anymore. Um, for one and for two, this was written as a system service, and so it's 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 meant to be run by you know very intelligent IT administrators, not not by just about everybody, and mm -hmm. has lots of config options, and and you set up the topology of who can communicate with what, and all that kind of stuff. It's it's very very complicated. So we sort of eliminated all that and generate all that stuff dynamically instead. Um, and the, the third thing we did is that since it's a service, it also has uh, sort of privileged uh, operations that it can that it can execute, which Messenger cannot, because Messenger does not run as a privileged uh, application. Mm. And so we had to sort of factor a lot of that stuff out. So one of the things um, Adam yeah. was mentioning was uh, this this uh, reading the the NTFS uh, change journal, which we'll talk about in a minute. But that's, a, that's one of those privileged operations, so we had to break out some of that functionality and add it as a separate service, which, which does run with privilege uh, and exposes the information that you can can use. So let me explain that a little bit. Sure. So, so you have Messenger, it's running on top of NTFS, mm -hmm. well, it's running on top of Windows, and you have an NTFS folder somewhere. Um, NTFS has a feature called the USN change journal that tracks changes to the NTFS files. So any change you make, rename, delete, uh, add new, you know, overwrites, uh, moves, you know, any, any file system operation is represented as, uh, as a record in that change journal. And so if you can read the change journal, you can figure out everything that's happened to your file system. Okay. Um, there's a little uh, problem with this is that this change journal um, tracks changes to the entire file system, but you may only have access to a certain set of the files. So what we had to do is when we read this NTFS journal, we have to strip out the pieces of information which you shouldn't have access to. Um, and we do that, uh, it made the, the main one, in fact the only one that's in the journal is the, is the name of the file. Because uh, some people use you know, the file names to mean something. So for instance, you know, if, if I was on you know, some important, uh, I don't know, let's say, the president's, you know, computer, and I could see their change journal, and there was a file called, you know, bomb somebody. Then I could tell that they're going to bomb somebody. So the name itself is something that you can't can't give out. Mm -hmm. So so what we do is we, we wrote a service um, that Messenger installs, and this thing runs, um, and you can connect to that service and ask for changes that that, that are in the chain the, the CSN change journal. Mm -hmm. um, but the service uh, obfuscates the name, so it basically does a one-way hash and then hands it back. So you can't do much with with this um, this one way hash except if if the file name is the same. So if the file name hasn't changed, that hash will still be the same hash that you had last time. So it sort of gives you a, a handle on what's changed. The other thing that's contained in the record that we do use is the file identifier. So NTFS has this low level file identifier, um, and with the file identifier, you can get access to the file if you have access to it, and then mm -hmm. from the file handle, figure out what the file name really is. So you can do the reverse mapping if you have access to the file. Mm -hmm. So um, so part of what we had to do is we had to get the Windows team to release this API to open by file ID, um, which didn't exist before. Um, sorry, it existed, but it wasn't available before. So we've now got that released, uh, so the public can use it, and then we use it to do that, that mapping. Excellent. So, um, so DFSR sort of sits inside of, of Messenger, as it were, using the Messenger transport. And um, what it does is it monitors folders that, that you're sharing out. Uh, looks at the USN journal to figure out what's changed, and when things have changed, it keeps uh, this, this database of information with one entry for every file in, in a folder that you care about. So if you create a new folder, it'll create a new entry for it, um, and it keeps this, this information, uh, replication metadata, um, phone's ringing, keeps this, uh, this, this replication metadata um, on, on all the files. So the basic things that it has, it has a version, it has a, a globally unique identifier um, so that uh, all the different peers agree to the same ID for e each file. So if I change a file that you've already seen, you'll see that it's a changed file, not a new file, mm -hmm. for instance. 
Um, so all that information is kept inside DFSR. The other thing it keeps is uh, sort of a summary of all those changes, which we're going to call, which we call a version vector. Okay. And that, we'll come back to that when we talk about how the sync actually happens. The other piece that we've added is um, basically a cache of the state of other peers. So we call this the VV cache. So when this version of Messenger, say this is Alice's version of Messenger, talks to Bob and they synchronize a folder, Alice will remember the state uh, at Bob's machine mm -hmm. so that when Bob comes online sometime in the future, we can see whether we think anything has changed and know whether we're going to sync with Bob or not. Does that make sense? Yes. It's a little bit... Um, it's a little bit more technical than that, or I guess we, we really aren't keeping track of the fact that it's Bob's machine. So that it's Bob, excuse me, we're keeping track of the fact that it's a particular instance of Bob's machine. So if Bob at work or Bob at home are going to be two different machines, and we have to have different sync states for them. Okay. So what can happen, for instance, if I share out information to Bob, he's at work, we synchronize, everything's good to go. He goes home, he may not have the latest copies of the files. So I also need to sync with him at home. Um, and one interesting thing about that is he's got work. So he can make changes at work, sync with me, go home, and then yeah. sync with me, and he'll pick up the changes from work even though his two machines didn't talk to each other directly. Yeah, that's Excellent. actually kind of a cool point. If you wanted to have a sort of a uh, kind of a way to roam your files, if you had the, you know, if, if, you, if your friend was okay with it, you could use your friend as a relay using the sharing folders. So if I had a file that, you know, whatever, a document, I could um, share it with John, go uh, move from work to home, and then get it from from my share with John, and then it would be a way for me to roam that document. Very that's just cool. today. That's kind of a little yeah. workaround, just for you know the, the the geeks out there. Sure. Well, there's lots of them out there. Yeah. So, real quick on on the on the algorithm we use, and uh, <laughs> so when so my messenger's running. Mm -hmm. When my messenger sees that somebody else comes online that I've synchronized with before. Okay. Uh, if I'll look in this cache, I'll say, has, has my state changed? So since the last time I sank with them, uh, has there, do, I, do I know about any changes to my file system or not? Mm -hmm. If there are changes, I'll send them an invite saying, you should come sync with me. Okay? At some point in time, I'll just say, okay, let's, I'll go sync with them because I want to pick up those changes. I have nothing else to do right now. And they'll, they'll establish one of these peer-to-peer -peer connections that John was talking about before. Okay. So now they've got a peer-to-peer -peer connection. They then exchange version vectors. So basically, I send this, this, this compact representation of all the changes that I know about to the other side that compares it. And by the comparison, you can figure out exactly what updates you have not seen on your side. Mm. Does that make sense? Yep. Then you basically, for each update, you just exchange the update back and forth. The update contains sort of what has changed about the file um, at, at a metadata level metadata level, so has the name changed, have the attributes changed, that kind of thing. If the file itself has changed, we have an algorithm for um, very compactly uh, and efficiently exchanging just the bits that have changed. Uh, it's a technology called remote differential compression um, that's built into the, this DFSR thing as well. So if, if, you've, if you have like a, a 10 megabyte file, uh, say a Word document, and you went in and you added a paragraph, we'll basically just exchange just that paragraph, not the whole thing. Um, that, that, that part's pretty easy, but what's really neat is if you go and delete stuff, it'll also, do the, it'll also figure out when, when things are deleted and, and just exchange the deletion. Um, uh, sort of simplistic algorithms uh, where if you like insert something, it would cause the whole diff to look like it's, the whole file to look like it's different because everything's at a different offset. So that's sort of an interesting technology as well. Definitely. Very cool. Well, thank you. That was uh, nicely, <laughs> nice and deep. Yeah. Very cool. Right. Yeah. yeah. So I, what's uh, next? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I wanted to. So I, I definitely want to make sure we get time. I'm just sitting here while, while some of these guys are talking, reading through some of the questions on the channel. From the Niners. Yeah. All right. And I, I want to get to them. Um, we have a, a few more uh, developers in the room that have yes, some pretty cool stuff to talk about. Um, for example, I mean, we get feature requests all the time. There's so many things people want. There's, you know the ability to have different personal messages set for different people on your buddy list mm -hmm. um, or to have a different sound play when you have a different person sign online, that kind of stuff. There's so many features. Um, we're not getting to them all as fast mm -hmm. as I know everyone in this room would like to. Sure. Um, so one of the, the ways that we're working with that is through this cool add-in feature. And it basically you know, allows developers um, out in the wild to build these things on top of Messenger. and. I mean, that's cool for developers, but it's way cool for everybody else because anyone can use these features. So any, if one developer goes out there and builds you know, one of these features that let, lets your, say you have a different display picture for mm -hmm. everyone on your buddy list or something, 
um, any anybody can use that add-in so that they can essentially have that feature. So it just it's a really awesome way for us to build Messenger really fast. Um, and so that's something Katie's been working on. So cool, and it opens it up to the community. Yeah. Right. So there's all kinds of cool things you could do. Yeah. So I guess. Like, um, starting from the beginning, I guess uh, add-ins are uh, actually just little .NET components that you build. Um, it's they're they're really really easy to build. Um, Wait, you said .NET components? Yeah. Wow. So, nice yeah, Messenger is actually hosting the CLR and excellent. Um, yep. So you can you can use VB, C Sharp, whatever you want, compile it into a .NET DLL and uh, inherit from one of our interfaces, and uh, there you go. You've got a, a Messenger add-in. That's excellent. Now, one of the add-ins I've always wanted to do, or features that I would like to see, would be I don't want to only have five options of my state. Yeah. I would like to be able to create multiple, like, and I, another thing would be like mood. State, so that right? Be, yeah. So, um, well, there's a couple of things. We're we're still under some limitations with regards to like what the present servers and what the server side uh, okay. logic will let us do, sure. um, but. Uh, one of the things you can do with add-ins um, is you can, we have something called a PSM or a personal status message mm -hmm. and that's kind of like as any kind of sentence you want to put in, um, for example, like whatever your own state is that you want to want to come up with and um, you can do that through Messenger's UI. You can also have an add-in that basically like automatically does that. So maybe the add-in like you know, has some knowledge of your schedule or something and knows, like, since it's midnight, you're asleep. And so it changes your PSM to be, like, Katie's asleep or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I can actually, um, so right now we have kind of, like, a limited set of sort of scenarios that add-ins can, can do. We really, we want to do a whole bunch more than what we currently have. But mm -hmm. some of the stuff we currently have going right now is kind of cool. So I can actually show you that would be an great. example add-in and sure. then how you can get started building your own. Come around here and do the old. So right now I've already I've kind of jumped ahead a little bit. I, I've already um, I've already added an add-in to Messenger, um, and one of the things that you can do is you can configure it so that um, the add-in that you've selected. I guess I should start a little bit more at the beginning. And so um, add-ins actually have. Add-ins actually, the way you program an add-in, you don't like directly say set Messenger's PSM to this or you know set uh, this the status to this. You actually an add-in itself is kind of like a fake identity, so it sort of has its own personal status message and its own um, its own status and its own friendly name and things along those lines. And so when you write an add-in, you're just kind of like filling those things out. It's really easy. And then inside Messenger's UI, you can actually select one of your installed add-ins to act as your agent, is kind of what we call it. Okay. Um, basically what that means is while the add-in is on, whatever the add-in's PSM is, kind of becomes your PSM or personal status message. Mm -hmm. um, likewise, what, whatever the add-in's features are, kind of like double over and kind of take over what your various identity features are. So I can kind of, in this case, I guess I can show you an options dialog. So if you go here, I need to get. Sorry, it's pretty obtrusive. But no problem. Very analog here. All right. <laughs> so um, this is a, a messenger options dialog, and there's a little add-ins tab down here. Um, and essentially, what's going on here is is this is a list of all your installed add-ins, and right now I only have one, and it's this it's this one called Demolia. And um, I'm, I'm going to select that add-in to be kind of my currently active add-in. So if I go ahead and apply that, now I can do something like set my status to away. Um, say I'll be right back. Oh wait, maybe not. Yeah, no, I'm just going to turn it on. So I went ahead and turned on my add-in. And essentially right away you can kind of notice um, this is sort of a personal pet add-in that, that we created. So right away you kind of see that the user tile for this person changed and the personal status message for this person changed. And it's kind of cool if somebody else notices that. So here's on another machine. If somebody else notices that and says, you know, hey, what's going on? You can actually see um, what happened. I didn't type anything over here. What happened is the add-in um, actually programmatically noticed that there was an incoming message, and it can parse that message and see that, oh, this is the first time this particular user's talked to this add-in. So it kind of gives all its introduction text, and the add-in actually sent this message back. 
And so you can actually do some pretty cool sort of AI stuff. Like, say, if I say something like, you know, um, having a... The add-in can the add-in notice that like the person types you know something that began with I and it immediately jumps to this funny text about oh enough about you let's talk about me and kind of starts going over its state. Excellent. And you can do anything you want like this particular add-in kind of tells you oh I understand a couple of these commands here so if I type something like give haircut you can see that the user tile actually changed and his hair got a little shorter. And what's kind of cool, if we look over on the machine that's actually running the add-in over here, yeah. the, the, the friendly, or the PSM actually changed to, to reference that somebody is actually talking to him. And so all of the buddies of this person actually see that, you know, the, actually see the user tile changing and, and the personal status message changing and things like that. Very cool. And what was it? Something else. Oh, and the other thing that's kind of cool is add-ins can, um, so if I go over, and this is like the local machine now, it's kind of confusing, I'm sure. But um, if I go and type something like, um, if I type something like that, um, essentially what happened is the add-in is also latching into the outgoing messages. And it noticed that the outgoing message, you know, started with a slash, so it's kind of a secret command to the add-in itself. So the add-in kind of processed that internally and actually incorporated what I just typed into its, into its AI. And it responded, instead of sending that message, it sent this, like, cool little action message here. And if over on the other side I type something about, you can see that, like, right away the add-in's AI already got smarter and, and more customized towards what, you know, basically the person running the add-in had done. Excellent. So there's, there's kind of a lot of cool uh, possibilities with that. We're, we're pretty excited about it. Um, Absolutely. We want to open it up and do a lot more APIs than what we have right now, but mm -hmm. the feature is actually live in our latest build. So Very if you go, cool. I have a blog. So, so this if is you, your blog? Yeah, so I, I just recently started this, and if you go here, there's a little blurb about what the feature is and what kinds of, this is kind of describes all the APIs we have exposed right now. And if you go down here at the very bottom, there's some sample code. Mm -hmm. And it shows you how, like, really, this is, like, what, 20 lines of code? It, it mostly comments. This is a really, really, it's really, really easy to, to write cool add-ins. Excellent. So. Very, very cool. So uh, you want to get to some Niner questions and then perhaps uh, Yahoo. 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 <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yahoo. The Niner questions. Oh, yeah, the Yahoo oh, Interop. Yeah, the Yahoo. I think... Yahoo is just the thing that's making us all go kind of crazy around here right now with excitement, good crazy. So, so what does it mean, Yahoo Interop? With their uh, messenger client, you can now communicate with it through? Um, yeah, so uh, initially we were going to do this. Uh, so basically now what you can do is you can add people who are using the Yahoo client basically on the Yahoo network and talk to them from Messenger, from Windows Live Messenger. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you can get presents from them if they're signed in on the Yahoo client. You can IM them, you can send them nudges, you can send them emoticons. Uh, there's a subset of the features that we support. We don't support everything yet. Uh, but in the first version, uh, IM, uh, emoticons, nudges, those are the ones that are supported. Um, um, that's cool. Yeah. So I mean, I mean, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> sorry. No, I, maybe let's talk about so so this feature. Uh, the general idea of being able to add someone from another network mm -hmm. uh, onto uh, Windows Live Messenger has been something that, that we wanted to do for a long time. Uh, specifically with Yahoo, we've been working with those guys for I mean over a year now, right? Yeah. Uh, and uh, we we went through a bunch of different. We, the key was we wanted to get this thing out quickly, mm -hmm. as quick as possible, make it so that people can actually talk to one another. Um, the, uh, and we maybe you can talk about the different routes that we looked at, looked at tec technically. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, is it purely a technical that. problem, though? I mean, certainly there's a policy um, level at the server. There's also like a business deal sure. that has to go through, right? Yeah. Um, other than that, there are technical issues where that the first route that we went down to actually approaching this problem was that we just we made the client actually talk to both the servers. And basically, which would mean that you would have to have an account on Windows Live Messenger and an account on uh, the Yahoo network. You'd have to sign into both, and then you can get like buddies from one to the other. Sure. But when we actually got, we actually had a working implementation of that code, and um, there was a demo, and a bunch of people liked it. But when we actually thought about it, we wanted it to be like email, where you just like have an email ID, 
send email to anybody in the world and it goes to that person. You don't have to have a Gmail account in order to send email to someone with a Gmail ID. Mm -hmm. So uh, initially, then we kind of it trickled down to this uh, scenario. The, the scenario we wanted to enable was that we just basically add anybody with a Yahoo ID in our client and we should be able to IM them and talk to them. So the first one was what we like to call it the client side approach where the client uh, talks to both the servers. Mm -hmm. Now it's the server side approach where the client talks to the messenger server and the messenger server talks to the Yahoo servers and that's how we get the interop. Um, so um, I can talk a little about... You can draw them up yeah, on the server. Yeah, let's, so, let's, let's draw the servers and then the talk about how... So I'm just going to add to this diagram okay. here. Um, so, um, John talk, spoke about how if you want to IM someone from A to B, it goes through the mixer. So the only change that we made here was um, for sending Yahoo IMs, we directly send the IM to the CS. The CS talks to the Yahoo cloud or the Yahoo servers. Mm -hmm. And they basically route it to their client. So that's all the difference. We don't talk to any of the mixers. Um, the RCS talks to the Yahoo servers through a modified version of the SIP. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not the full SIP standard. I don't know the exact details, but they've they've removed a lot of the state and session uh, maintenance information that comes along with the SIP protocol. Mm -hmm. um, so that's it, it. Was very simple to implement IM wise, but uh, we had to we had to make changes to like add them to a lot of adding Yahoo contacts to our address book and. Uh, do you want me to talk about like some of the challenges we had there? Of course. <laughs> well, I mean, uh, no yeah, challenges. no challenges. No challenges. No challenges. No challenges. No challenges. No challenges. We only have ten. We only have ten minutes of tape left, so. Uh, so do you want to do the demo then? I want to do some questions first. You should do the questions. Uh, yeah. Okay. So it's been of a, like of a, oh, of a Yahoo client talking to a. Or we can yeah. So I can I can show it to you on right here. I'm having crappy wireless, so the messages are kind of delayed. Uh -huh. But here's an example. I have both of my clients, and as you can see right here, I have all kinds of Yahoo people. And if I send a message from Windows Live to Yahoo, it gets there after you know our very fast wireless picks it up. See, there we go. It just appeared on the Yahoo side. Great. And they can nudge over here, and you'll see a nudge after a couple seconds. Thank you for uh, somewhat instant messaging. Yeah, it's faster on my Relatively other nice. computers, but sure. Yeah, my there, other we there we go. There we go. But you can change, you know, your presence, and they'll see it on the other side. You can add emot, you can send emoticons. Those work, and I mean, it's it's pretty nice. Now you don't have to run two clients if you're both a Windows Live and a Yahoo user. That's right. True. You can. I mean, it'll be one day when everyone is using Card Space, aka InfoCard. And you could have, you just use your info card and talk to anybody you want as long as there's policies, a server, and you yeah. have business decisions. Yeah. Right? Agreement. Yeah. And we just have to get a new bridge on there that's like mine to mine. Yeah. And that would be great. Oh, yeah. yeah, you got yeah, it. I, one thing I think is so interesting. Work on that. <laughs> Make it happen. Well, I just think it's really interesting to watch kind of how the, the business is going right now where we see, you know, we're sitting here in the IM world and we're trying so hard to interop between, mm -hmm. you know, all the other different IM clients. We don't understand why these artificial lines are being drawn. And then I'm sitting there watching TV commercials and you hear Verizon and Sprint and all these mobile services are trying so hard to build up these barriers where it's all about the in-network and they're trying to, they're going in a completely different direction. I just, I find that fascinating. Very interesting. So I have um, I have a bunch of these uh, Niner, Niner questions. questions. So yeah. let's make sure that we're, let's show everyone that we're actually uh, yeah we're actually there. Yeah. Um, All right. So so um, I've just been reading through them. There's a lot of uh, themes. So rather than kind of get at only specific questions, I'm going to try and answer some of the ones I see here that are appearing a lot. Okay. Um, a lot of people have questions about um, advertisements or adverts. I bet we have a number of. Uh, British Niners. I'm yes, you do. <laughs> um, so, so, so one thing a lot of people are asking, you know, why do we have to see these adverts everywhere? Why can't we turn them off? So the very easy answer to that question is, mm -hmm. you know, we have a huge team of people. It's all pretty much funded exclusively by ads. So, you know, we got to have ads in there in order to uh, eat dinner. Okay. That said, I, I actually really value these comments because there's definitely an idea behind good advertising and bad advertising. Mm -hmm. um, and n not to say we're doing bad advertising, but actually an area that we're really trying to focus on, which is, 
you know, having, you know, irrelevant ads, you know, you're uh, maybe happily married and you're getting these match ads, you know, how to find a date or something, that's not necessarily that appropriate. So one thing that um, we have a, a bunch of people working on right now is how to get at least if we're going to have ads to fund us, you know, in the client, they're going to be relevant and they're going to be non-intrusive and, you know, they're actually going to show up if you're IMing with someone. Well, I don't know if we're going to do contextual, but That's if you're hard. IMing, yeah, it, it's hard and it's also, it's a little scary that it looks like we're monitoring sure. IM conversations. But we just want to make sure that if we're going to have ads there, they're, they're actually things that people might actually find interested in. And the advertisers feel the same way. They, they want to get ads to the right people. So sure. that's something we're not, you know, just trying to splash a whole bunch of color all over the place and um, and we know it's that's not, not like you're, it's profit making. It's you have to pay for the people that think up and write the software like you guys. Yeah. Because you I mean you don't want to do this for free. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, not, it's, no. it's not just us too if, if, if it were or not. If it were all peer to peer, um, we wouldn't have as much uh, operating costs, but it isn't. As you can see from those boards, sure. all those boxes on the top end yeah. are all um, boxes that cost money on a daily basis. So sure. we, we have to pay for them. We yeah. send a lot of traffic to our servers. Yeah. A lot of traffic. Mm -hmm. we, with 240 so, million people, I mean, we have over 100 million logins a day, so yeah. billions of, of messages to pass through there, and we have to pay for all that bandwidth. So, exactly. Um, anyway, that, that's, yeah. that's one of the so things. All right, so I think that's kind of clear. Yeah. I mean, yeah, and to wrap that up, a few people said you didn't used to have ads. Well, we didn't used to make any money. <laughs> we, yeah, so exactly. we used to lose a lot of money. So that's, that's part of the reason. You're for getting that. closer to the black now. Yeah, on MSM exactly. Land. It hasn't always been the case. <laughs> Um, Although you've always had the nicest yeah. campus, which when I was in Windows used to bum me out. <laughs> Windows makes you know half the money that the company makes, and we have this crappy building in 26. It's right? just the newest, that's why. Yeah. Oh, okay. It was the newest. Very cool. Yeah. So, All right, let's move um, on to the next yeah. one. Yeah, so some other questions. A lot of people have questions about winks and nudges. Um, so um, this gets back to something we were talking about in the beginning. So you'd be surprised. I get a lot of email from a lot of different types of people. And I would say my inbox is filled with about half people saying winks and nudges make me want to, as someone put in here, gouge my eyes out. Mm -hmm. um, and then um, the other half saying, you know, winks are my favorite things in the entire world. When are we going to get new winks? Sure. Um, so that's one of those things where, you know, we just have just a staggeringly diverse group of people. Mm -hmm. and. Um, one thing that I think we've been aiming for is to kind of try and get everything in there so that people can kind of pick and choose what they what they use. So if we have everything available, then in theory we can kind of make everyone happy, of course, except for a lot of, and I think a lot of the Niners, which are kind of the minimalists that don't want to look at a bunch of stuff that they're not well, going to Well, I mean, theoretically, I certainly recall in the file options menu, I can turn, I can disable nudges, and I can That's disable right. yeah. winks, and I can disable the little smiley faces. So. And, in, in general, especially with Windows Live, we, we want to make it more and more configurable. So the idea is the user controls his or her experience. Yep. Obviously, we've got to have some ads. Um, but, uh, but in general, uh, we want to make it easier and more, more obvious how to turn you know, bits off that, that people don't like. Sure. Um, yeah. so, but you know, it, is, it is interesting to note that you know, Windows Messenger is still out there for the most part. Mm -hmm. and, um, uh, MSN Messenger now Windows Live Messenger it, it eclipsed uh, that product, um, you know, something like ninety percent, um, and you know, so so somebody's liking the the winks and the nudges and the user tiles. So this brings up an interesting question. I mean, are the days of Windows Messenger over? Yes. yes. I mean, it really should be. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's yeah. over. Yes. It's not in distant. So okay. although someone, I mean, I saw someone on here said, you know, I really like Windows Messenger. What are you doing? Why are you taking it away from me? Um, and and the answer to that is really just to try and focus our resources. I mean, before we had a team in a completely different building working on Windows, and we were working on MSN, and we weren't really talking to each other very much. And yeah. um, it, this is a really great way for us to focus our efforts and get all the right stuff in one client instead yeah. of trying to, you know, juggle two or yeah you know, beyond. Excellent. Um, so are there any other? Oh, so those are the two major. Technical question about the blocking. There's a technical. Someone, oh. yeah, someone thought yeah. someone can answer that one. Uh, let's see. It was. It was. If I if I block someone, can they still find out what my status? Yeah. Can they know is? whether or not I'm blocking them? Uh, no, not unless they ask one of your buddies who hasn't blocked you. I mean, there's no way in the protocol they can tell. But you know, if I blocked Katie, but I didn't block Adam, and Katie just asks Adam, "Hey, is John online?" Then Adam could tell her. But there's no way from the protocol you could tell. The server will just tell her that I'm offline if I block her. 
Okay. So same thing with a peer offline too. Yeah, like, yeah a peer offline works it, basically the same way. Um, yeah, except if I'm appearing offline, I can establish outgoing connections to people uh, mm -hmm. in certain cases that I might not be able to if I block them. Well, if you appear offline, you can't actually send instant messages, which yes, I think you is can. wrong. You, can. you can't write yeah. today. You can today in 8.0. You today in 8.0, you can. Yes. Yeah, that's what I meant. Yeah, I, mean, people yeah. ask I used to be like, it's a peer right. offline, right? <laughs> right? <You're> not <laughs> yeah. offline. Yeah. All right. Because yeah. you might want to be offline and then still email people yeah. that that's you don't. Right. Yeah. You know what people I mean? ask for it, so we did that. Which would be interesting if you could have contextual status in the sense that. Uh, I want to be offline for this person that's a pain in the A. Yeah. But yes, for everyone yes, else, I'm hurts. online. People have asked for that. I'm away. And they for want my like boss, a, I'm working. Yeah. yeah. They want different pictures for their coworkers yeah. and for their friends. And, and this you is know, all happening in A. No, that's not in A. That's, that's, not, that's something coming. We're, we're working that's on. That's coming, yeah. That's, uh, John's just saying we, we get that a lot. Even people on the team want that. I want sure. that. And it's, I, I don't well, know. Well, you're a developer. Make it happen. I want it for plugins, too. Excellent. It's actually, we, we, I don't know if you guys agree, but in a lot of ways, it's not really a tech, as much of a technical challenge as it is figuring out how to show it to the user. Yep. Um, we've, we've, are you? Are we? We're running, running out. out. Okay. Okay. Oh. Anyway, so, so hey, thank things you. are coming. Yeah. yeah. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs> thank you. Last part of words. Um. Oh. Go get the client. Yeah. Go, go get, get the client. Go get the client. Get the client. Yeah, yeah. And we'll put the link up. Yeah. Uh, Keep giving us feedback. On. And write some plugins. Get feedback. Write some plugins. Write some plugins. Niners, complainers. Write plugins. Yeah. Write the plugins. All right. Yeah. Very Tell good. me what APIs we need to add. Cool. And just, yeah, Channel 9, I'm sure they'll, the Niners will speak up. And yeah, fantastic. Give cool. advice. Yeah. And thanks, thanks for, for uh, watching. Yeah, thank you. <laughs>